Trump as president, we do talk American politics. More of that in the show. I'm in Brussels today where civil servants are locked uh, behind doors trying to come up with a final Brexit deal. It's all down to people's interpretation of what the backstop means and what happens with the Irish border. Uh, the great sense here is that time is running out. My sense here is we're really very close to a deal. But something else that's happened today that I think is very significant indeed. French President Emmanuel Macron is on a week-long tour of the Western Front battlefields ahead of the big commemorations of the 100th anniversary of the armistice, which of course take place this Sunday on the 11th. Uh, and of course we will have our main national event at the Cenotaph with many thousands of other events taking place around the country. But the big international event will be at the Arc de Triomphe on Sunday, 80 world leaders are expected. It's a war, of course, in which all the participants suffer grievously, the French more than many. And today, Macron was at, I think, the single most significant place for France in that war, Verdun. The very name of that town had a huge psychological impact on France for many, many decades to come. It's a battle that begins in February 1916 with the German leader Falkenhayn saying, we will bleed France white, an attritional battle. It got so bad and so serious that the British prematurely, they really weren't ready, launched the Battle of the Somme in July of that year to relieve the pressure. The battle went on until November. You can go and visit uh, Verdun today and you can see uh, just square mile after square mile of shell pot ground, uh, six villages that were literally destroyed to nothing and never rebuilt, uh, vast cemeteries, and at the centre of it all, a huge ossuary in which there are the bones of 120,000 dead soldiers organised in piles by body parts. And if you've got the stomach for it, you can look through the windows and see it. And it was at Verdun in 1984 where the President of France at the time, Mitterrand, and Chancellor Kohl of Germany stood and held hands in front of the ossuary, and they said, from this, we move on to a united Europe. It was the first time I'd ever seen in public European leaders saying the European community, as it was then known, would move on to a full political union, the argument being the sheer horror of industrial warfare between France and Germany had to be replaced by something. Well, today, visiting Verdun, Emmanuel Macron has gone a whole lot further. We have to protect ourselves with respect to China, Russia, and even the United States of America. When I see President Trump announcing that he's quitting a major disarmament treaty, which was formed after the 1980s Euro missile crisis that hit Europe, who is the main victim? Europe and its security. We will not protect the Europeans unless we decide to have a true European army. We need a Europe which defends itself better alone without just depending on the United States in a more sovereign manner. A true European army, says Emmanuel Macron, backing up comments from Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, who said not so long ago, deference to NATO can no longer be used as a convenient alibi to argue against greater European efforts. Folks, they're building a European army. They're not messing about. Isn't it funny? You know, people complain. The, the Ramonas complain that Boris put some numbers on the side of a bus and somehow that was a terrible lie. Do you know something? They've been lying to us for 50 years about the true intentions of the European Union. None more so, in my opinion, than back in 2014 when LBC hosted a debate with Nick Ferrari in the chair and it was between me and the then Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg. And we talked about the prospects of a European army. 40 years ago, it was a common market. Now it's a European Union that wants an air force, an army, a navy, and wants to militarily intervene. This is a dangerous fantasy. <coughs> the idea that there's going to be a European air force, a European army, it's it proposed. is simply not true. Oh. Simply not true, says Cleggers. Simply not. About all the way through, it's just a common market. Don't worry your silly little heads. Lies, lies, lies. Well, I don't know where you are, uh, Sir Nick Clegg, uh, tonight, but please, 0345 606 is the number. Maybe you've moved off to Facebook already. I don't know. I've warned about this for a very, very long time. But given that President Trump is going to be in France 
on Sunday. Isn't it extraordinary for Emmanuel Macron, the French president, to say we have to protect ourselves with respect to China, Russia, and even the United States of America? Is this not aggressive, outrageous language to use against a key ally? If you think, no, it's the right thing, he's protecting himself in Europe, call 0345 6060 973. If you think it's wholly unacceptable and damn rude and ungrateful, text to 84850 and tell me, is there anything wrong with the European army? And, interestingly, are we going to be involved? And we'll discuss that over the course of the next hour. Please tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And, of course, Facebookers. You can watch us live and comment there, too. And I think it is outrageously offensive towards the Americans. But regular listeners to the show will know I crossed swords a couple of weeks ago with the President of the European Parliament, Mr Tajani, who said the European Union had beaten Nazism and communism. They're trying to rewrite history. They're trying to use history to build a new superpower. And I think, actually, it's a dangerous development. Malcolm is calling from Baker Street. Good evening, Malcolm. Well, good evening, Nigel. Um, I've just been listening to your uh, comments about this, uh, what's his name, President Macaroni. Uh, he's <laughs> an absolute imbecile, isn't he? This is the chap who wants to basically uh, take umbrage with the leader of the free world and basically yep. disrespect him it, it, at a time when we should all be coming together to remember the sacrifices people made over yep. these two world wars. And he's got the audacity to stand there and basically say that we should protect ourselves against the USA. I'll tell you something for nothing, Nigel. We need to protect ourselves from this Mr. Macaroni because he's the one that's causing trouble. I've got umbrage with him, well. you know. I tell you what, he is damned insulting towards the Americans who made massive sacrifices so that France could be free. He's also, Malcolm, he's also trying to hold NATO below the waterline. Malcolm, I've got the point. Oliver is calling from where? Good evening, Oliver. Oh, good evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm well, but I, I, I just cannot believe that... I mean, I, I get that Verdun's important to the French, but I just do not get this insult to America at this time. Well... I'm, uh, before I begin, I'll just uh, admit that I am an open uh, Europhile, but I have to concur um, with what you're saying, and especially at this time of year, as well yes. as your previous caller said, you know, armistice yes. coming up. I yes. think um, Emmanuel Macron uh, doesn't seem to be very well versed in um, the principle of rail politic or indeed uh, geopolitical um, studies, because the EU and EU leaders should really be leading, you know, by example, and his comments today the connotations of isolationism and violence, it fosters um, rather negative um, thoughts. And whatever your opinion on Donald Trump, you need to remember and Europe needs to remember that it was the United States of America that really rebuilt um, Europe and to now come out well, with, this, absolutely. with this violent, yeah, absolutely. violent rhetoric, really. I think, you know, of course you can have differences with various leaders, but to suggest that Europe now becomes some sort of insular um, you know, nation state, uh, sorry, supranational um, state, I, I think is disappointing, especially yeah, you know, as we see that and, international diplomacy is collapsing in certain parts of the world. And, the European and, Union should be And he says, example. Oliver, he says, we need a Europe which defends itself better alone without just depending on the USA in a more sovereign manner. So he's transferring sovereignty from a nation state to the EU level, but he's basically trying to get rid of NATO. It's a pretty stupid thing to do, Oliver, isn't it? You know, obviously, if you look at, you know, America is the biggest um, contributor to the budget. Big and time. I think, you know, the, the whole um, idea, the whole ethos of the European Union was to foster a spirit of cooperation. And Emmanuel Macron's comments today kind of subvert that very... Yeah, well, you see, you see, Oliver, I've been saying now, and um, people haven't listened to me, obviously, but I've been saying for over a decade, there is a new nationalism. It's EU nationalism, and it's very worrying and very dangerous. Oliver, great call. Thank you. David and Romford is a new caller to the show. David, what do you make of Macron's comments? You both sound quite rational, if you ask me. Right, so insulting the Americans just a few oh, no. days ahead of President Trump going, going to the Arc de Triomphe is rational. Um, Nigel, why do you always overinflate everything? How has he insulted the Americans? He, he said the United States of America could pose a threat to Europe. 
Well, of course they could. But they're our main <laughs> ally in NATO. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Trump himself has been trying to downplay NATO and wants Europe to look after it themselves anyway. No, no, no not- wrong. Wrong. David, you're wrong. Trump has said he wants other members of NATO to pay the 2% membership fee and then he'll be happy with it. The trouble is, of 28 members, only six are currently paying their way. Yeah, yeah, but also, Nigel, you have to be able to read between the lines. Do we not have a great, massive, great aircraft carrier that we can't even put fighter planes on? Well, that's because it might help if the rest of Europe helped us to put planes on that aircraft well, carrier, wouldn't it? Well, it might help us, David, if we had a British government that actually believed in defence. But look, uh, yeah, I mean, but David, knew about that. David, do you believe? Let me, let me ask you: Do you <laughs> believe that the development of a European army is the right way to go? Of course, it is. Do you want a, you want a war with Europe? We just want little island on the side of the mainland. David, I take a different view, but you've made the argument for European army. Thank you. Uh, and Richard in Chelsea asks me, if there is a European military strike force, what's the chain of command and the rules of engagement? All I can say to that, Richard, I hope it's not Jean-Claude Juncker after a good lunch. You're listening to the Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's 6.15. I said it for years. They're going to build a European army. They all laughed at me. Clegg said it was a dangerous fantasy, but hey, it's out there. Juncker's been hinting, and today, President Macron has made it clear that they are going to build, they must build, a true European army to counter threats that include the United States of America, and in so doing, willfully, in my view, trying to hold NATO below the waterline. But it's okay, Brexiteers, because our Prime Minister tells us that Brexit means Brexit. So presumably, we are not a part of this. We are in for a shock, because under permanent structured cooperation, known as PESCO, which legislation was put in place for back in 2009, and it was activated in 2017, that's after the Brexit referendum, we are a part of it. British forces are a part of it. In fact, 3rd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, landed uh, in Eastern Europe not so long ago, wearing European Union flags on their sleeves. There is so little debate about this but there needs to be why because i see a european union that is militarizing i see a european union without proper democratic control and scrutiny i see a european union that is expansionist and a european union that is fanatical far from stopping wars which was the thinking after verdun and world war ii and all of those things these people really worry me Stuart says, what a thing to say to the USA. No doubt all part of a plan to get some harsh words in response from McDonald. Then they will claim we've got to have an army. Well, Stuart, uh, Donald's quite busy today with the midterms. I cannot imagine that Trump will go to France on Sunday and not comment in some way on Macron's comments. Gary says the US are our closest allies and Macron is a disgrace. Alison feels the same on Facebook. It's a disgrace. The USA should remind them of the sacrifices Americans made when it wasn't really their problem. And isn't that the point, Alison? I mean, you know, World War One, those doughboys coming across the Atlantic to help Europe. They didn't need to. James is a new caller from Camden. Good evening, James. Good evening, Nigel. I, I hear your sentiments, but I say a third way. We need a very strong Europe with a strong um, American ally. I think you you look to history, but was it not for the arrival of the Americans in 1917 and that final offensive in the autumn of 18 with the Americans there, there wouldn't have been the armistice. And there are many arguments that we should have gone all the way and actually invaded Germany. And actually put peace peace in there. But the point is, we need a very strong Europe and we in Britain need to be part of that. And only by being part of Europe will we be able to have that voice and ensure that we have a strong Europe and strong NATO. And James, there's the one moment, problem. With you that. have to blame. You have to blame at the moment two people. One, Brexit, which has caused this organisation, and Vladimir Putin is laughing all the way, all the way to our, our, our borders on Eastern Europe. We need. Um, and uh, 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 to be part of this. You are right that we need everybody to uh, share the, the bill and pay their 2%. Absolutely. So that, inclu- that includes us. But we also need less isolationist rhetoric from Donald Trump, which is allowing the forces of Russia 
to literally what about Macron? play with our very security. What about Macron? Macron today was being isolationist. Macron was insulting our greatest military ally. I think you have to move beyond... Uh, he's been pushed into a corner by being deserted by us, who are allowing chaos in Europe, and we will pay the price of it, and by a president who is turning in on himself, and, uh, and you may or may not believe James? in Russian conspiracy theories, but ignoring their duties to be part James, of I the want world a Europe. order. Look, I want a Europe that cooperates together, right? I want a Europe where nation states work together. I think the best way for joint defence is through nation states cooperating through NATO. I see a European army as potentially being a very dangerous thing with or without us. Do you see why? I mean, when I, I keep hearing here in Brussels, they want to expand to the east. They want... It is an empire here. Barroso, the former commission boss, called it that. What is wrong, James, with nation-states cooperating under the NATO structure? I, I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just pointing out, Nigel, the reason we're here is because we have deserted Europe when no, 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 James, no, no James. Look, look, look no, come on. Come on. No, when no, I had that round... an analogy of football. If you have 28 people playing football, according to the rules, and suddenly the 29th pitch breaks off and says, I'd like to change the rules. And by the way, I'm too broke to do it alone. Well, we are broke. We are not the nation we were in 1918, and certainly not in 1945. Well, we, well, we, we hang on, we were broke together. then, weren't we? <laughs> we were broke we in 1918 in many ways. We be involved in Europe and lead Macron in South Africa like an old schoolboy with no money James, I think, I, honestly, I, I think you misunderstand Macron's motives. They, they loathe America. They loathe everything it stands for. Trump gives them a good reason to do so. And they want to destroy NATO. They believe that Europe is going to become, the European Union is going to become, one of the world's great global military and economic superpowers. James, please, I think you are viewing these people too kindly. But the French had the biggest number of casualties of World War One. They more than any more than the Germans and more than us. They mm, more than anyone bullshit. else go to every village, know the perils of war. It cannot happen again. And we are edging there. And if we carry on arguing amongst ourselves whether we're in or out, we can be in both. In both. James, I and that's I, where I, Britain's I, been stronger. James James, we cannot have NATO in Europe and a European army. The two don't work together. That's my view. We agree to disagree. I thank you very much indeed for your call. Matthew says, when has Europe not been able to depend upon America? Matthew, you can still depend upon America. All Trump wants is people to pay their fair share. What on earth is wrong with that? This is another step towards a country called Europe. One, one country, one currency, one flag. Most of us have known it for years. I find Macron's statement utterly disgusting. He has dirted the memory of 536,708 US military members that died in two wars, saving Europe from its own stupidity. Well, Chris, I agree with that. I'm going to Cobham to speak to Phil. Good evening, Phil. Good evening, Nigel. Uh, Nigel, firstly, I mean, I don't know what, what you've read, or maybe I've read wrong. I'm just reading out of the Independent. And I think you've got it absolutely wrong what, he's, what he said. I haven't heard the interview, I must admit, so I don't know what um, nuances were there. But the quote I'm seeing is, when I see President Trump announcing that he's quitting a major disarmament treaty which was formed after the 1980s Euro missile crisis that hit Europe, who is the main victim, Europe and its security. All he's actually saying, he's not insulting, he's not saying that America, the United States of America have become, have become the enemy. All he's saying is he's concerned about what you know, American military policy uh, will be. And I'm absolutely with him there. I mean, well, let me repeat, you will Phil, never accept. Phil, Phil, let me repeat, let me repeat. This is Macron. Today... We have to protect ourselves with respect to China, Russia, and even the United States of America. He couldn't have been clearer. Exactly what I said, you know. So he's not saying, you know, he's saying, and even the United States of America, meaning, you know, uh, this is how I read it. But anyway, you know, the bottom line is, whether you like it or not, Nigel, you <laughs> always go on about the United States of America, saying what a great, you know, example they are of freedom and democracy. Yes, they are United States. Take California out of the United States, and they're a fraction of what they are. You, but you, California, you yeah, 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 but hang on, hang on, hang on. Union should be. Ca 
But California is in the United States. There's no prospect it is, of it yes, leaving. But the point is, it is United States. And there is yes. nothing wrong with believing. You know, I've traveled the world quite extensively, and there is no place in the world where I feel safer or more comfortable than in Europe. And I've lived and worked, uh, I've spoken to you before. I can't get this point through. You, you totally, you know, in this modern world, when we have no idea what's going to happen in China, hopefully they will, <coughs> you know, revert, eventually revert to a, you know, very modern liberal uh, democratic state, but who knows? There, we've got a rising empire in China and a declining empire in America. <coughs> no person alive can remember America being other, any other than number one. Well, I tell you what, American Phil. Psyche, I tell you what, Phil. American if we face, Nigel does not accept anything if, other than if, number if one. If we were to face a great military threat, I would ask you, Phil, who would you rather was on our side, Trump? NATO and the Americans, or Mr. Juncker and his European army? Well, I've got to be honest, Nigel, you go on about Trump. I think he's the most dangerous thing that's ever, ever happened to the Western world as leader of the Western world. So I've got no problem with, with that. So I the man know that is, that guy believes you, you know, we, we, we had the warmonger Obama, we had the warmonger Clinton, we had the warmonger Bush, we have okay, President Nigel, Trump, who really gets the North Koreans... This. To the table. These, you know, the, and I'm sorry. Oh, come on. You are. Nigel, I'm sorry. You, you, you jest yeah. when you go on like this. He's this not a warmonger like everybody it's else. He's not a warmonger like Blair, kids. is he? It's, uh, uh, look, the, 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 these issues are incredibly complicated, Nigel. I mean, for Chris, goodness let, sake. Phil, any, let, me let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a quick question. Time is running out. Quick question. Do you yeah. think a full European army and NATO can coexist? I, I think that if you've got a full European army, of which Britain is truly a leading part of, there is actually no need for NATO. And right, America Phil. Well, Phil. No, Phil. There we are. We've got it. You and I disagree. I want us to maintain a close military relationship with America. You think Europe's the way forward. And that is what Democratic Debate here on LBC is all about. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show. It is now 6.30. French President Emmanuel Macron at Verdun today says we have to create a true European army to protect ourselves against countries like the United States of America. Isn't this aggressive language against a key ally just a few days before the armistice commemoration at the Arc de Triomphe? I think it is. I think a European army is very, very dangerous. <sighs> Meanwhile... In America, millions of Americans are going to the polls today. In fact, the truth is, nearly 40 million have already gone to the polls and taken part in early voting, their form of postal voting, and that is a record. Many see this as a referendum on Donald Trump's presidency halfway through. You know, I can barely remember in years gone by, uh, in the UK, us even talking about the midterm elections, and it's been a massive issue in the news. Everything to do with Trump, of course, is huge. If the Democrats take control of either parts of Congress, it could be very difficult for Trump to push laws through. They could even try and impeach him. So all 435 seats in the House of Representatives, the lower house, are up for grabs today, and a third of the Senate, 35 seats, are up today as well. Uh, let's listen to the final plea from President Trump. I've had a lot of people say, I don't know what midterm is, but now I'm watching every single minute, and I'm going out to vote. But the key is you have to go out to vote, because in a sense, I am on the ticket. <laughs> well, in a sense, he is on the ticket, and he knows it. it. You know, people are going out there to vote for Trump or against Trump, uh, and I suspect uh, a little bit less about the individual candidates in their districts um, or in their states. And, of course, the Democrats, who don't have a leader, have had to drag out of retirement their former leader, Obama. Here was his advice today. What kind of politics we expect is on the ballot. How we conduct ourselves in public life is on the ballot. How we treat other people is on the ballot. Mm. Interesting. Love him or hate him, you got to say that Donald is in combative form and sounding pretty upbeat. And whatever you think of President Obama, I thought he sounded pretty down and depressed today. Maybe he's not well, I don't know. Listen, I can't predict what will happen. Um, there are only two midterm elections since 1826 when the incumbent president actually won. Uh, one of them happened to George W. Bush in the wake of 9-11. So all the odds say that Trump will lose control at least of 
the lower house today, probably keep control of the Senate. Um, and that's what I guess the smart money is saying. But what we do know about Trump is all previous polling about this man has been completely and utterly wrong. And when you see a high turnout, well, it means there are people made of to vote for him and against him. Look, this is impossible to call. Uh, all I can say is he does have a habit of surprising everybody. And at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, when Nick Ferrari comes on air on LBC, we will have a pretty good picture as to what the upshot of this is. Back to Monsieur Macron. And in my view, his insulting language. On Twitter, I get, seems like a good idea, given we cannot rely on NATO with Trump. A European army is a good idea to remove American far-right influence from Europe and the Atlanticists. Well, I tell you what, matey, I don't know who you are, but if you really, really, really think our security would be better by ditching America and going in with Juncker's army, I couldn't disagree more. On Twitter, NATO has passed its sell-by date. The EU has common land and economic assets to defend. Logical caveman to city-state to country and now regional. One world and one currency is way overdue. Oh, Lewis, I mean, you know, it's lovely. Trotsky could have said that 100 years ago. I know there are people that believe that the EU is a model for one world government, but I promise you they are not ready to have an EU army, and I would not trust them with it. That's my view. And Martin on Twitter says, the army, one of the reasons why we voted to leave. If only Mrs May understood that and we weren't part of PESCO. Let's go to David in Rochford, a new caller to the show. Good evening, David. Hello, Nigel. I want to thank you for everything you've done over the years and changing politics as we know it today. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people, David, trying to change it back, but uh, here we are where we are. Um, what do you make of these comments and their well, timing in particular? I'm, go I'm going to say um, cynically. Now, Belgium has ordered the F-35 over the U.S. Uh -huh. fighter. Yep. Um, we're OK because we have a high percentage in the F-35, not so much in Europe or the Euro fighter. I think that Macron is doing this is because with the EU army, he can then justify spending and his country being the main development of uh, military hardware. So I think he's saying Trump's really, really bad. We need the EU to have an own army. And if they have their own army, they can say, well, we can design and do everything else ourselves. So I think he's just saying this out because obviously France was quite annoyed that lots of other countries are getting the F-35 over the Euro Yeah, fighter, which yeah, they yeah, no, David you, David, you may be right, but it's a very high-risk game to insult America, given firstly what it's done for France, and secondly, Trump is committed to NATO, provided people pay their way. Really I, rather foolish, isn't it, to do this? Well, it, well it's, it's just like Argentina. When everything's going bad, you need a boogeyman. So if they drum up national support and, do I dare say, EU nationalistic support against the enemy, it might bring everyone else together to say they're really bad, the UK's really bad, America's really mm. bad, let's all work mm. together. I think it's just a rouge so that people can have a bad man to rally against rather than them actually seeing that it's like you say, the EU's okay. trying to expand. But it's a dangerous game, David. It's a dangerous game. Thank you for your call. Uh, Twitter is producing a lot of pro-EU army stuff. Given the fact we share lots of security concerns with our neighbours, plus we can barely afford to feel our own military, well, we could, uh, plus the US has demonstrated it's unreliable at leading NATO, it makes perfect sense. I do not believe America is unreliable at leading NATO. It wants people to do things properly. I thought the EU was about peace, not war. Well, my worry is the project founded on peace could well end up causing a war. And I mean that, folks. A militarised European Union without proper democratic control. They're, going to, they're, they're working hard to abolish veto on foreign policy decisions like this, and they want to continue to expand to the east. Les says they always wanted to be a superpower, and that is true. Jan is calling from Housen and Whiten, and is a new caller to the show. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. Welcome. So, is, I mean, look, even if you did think a European army ultimately might be a good idea, isn't the timing of this completely crass? So, so 
I'll, I'll give him a thought, Nigel. I'm not necessarily angry with his comments. I'm more disappointed with his comments. One, okay. because of the timing, and two, because of my background. So mm-hmm. I, I spent 23 and a half years with the Royal Air Force. I've served with NATO. I've been uh, across Europe. I've been in America. I've been in Iraq. Uh, I've, I've been across a number of operational fields uh, with the coalition forces. I, I see the value and the benefits of having what may be regarded as a special relationship uh, with, with America, but equally I see the benefits that it brings of having that coalition. What, what yeah. I find disappointing is, is that I seem to think that Macron has forgot the roots of, of how that coalition has managed to maintain Europe as the free sort of democratic state that it is. Forget about the, the, the actual European Union, but just the fact of how it now exists given that coalition supporting uh, an effort to, to, to take away what happened in the First World War and the Second World War. So the, the, the timing, I think, one, it's insulting, and two, it's extremely disappointing from, uh, f- from a leader who is, who is becoming more and more prominent uh, as an EU voice. Yes, I mean, he is trying to become the great, big, strong pro-EU voice, but uh, the truth of it, Jan, is, of course, his own popularity is collapsing in France. Um, And I, you know, there's still, amongst the peoples of Europe, a lot of sympathy and support for America because of because of history and because of culture today. You know, what do our kids watch? They watch American TV. I, 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 think, he, I, I think he's done himself great harm with this. Jan, can I ask you, as somebody with nearly quarter of a century's service, what does this Sunday mean to you? It's huge. It's, it, it's enormous. It's, it's about... It, for me, it's about reflection. It's about reflection yeah. on the sacrifices that were made by those, you know, you know a, a century ago, it's reflection on on the people in today's current operational fields who are making those sacrifices towards their family. It, it, it's enormous. Everybody is uh, inextricably bound by bound by essentially taking taking pain away, t- taking pain out the world. It, it's about but a day I of remembrance. It. I suspect you know, it means a bit. I, I guess, I it, guess, must, it must mean more to you, Jan, than it means to others that haven't served. It does, but then again, I would start to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to Im- Im- impose my inner thoughts on that, Nigel. I, I guess when, when we look at what's happening uh, coming up in, in, in the next four months, uh, I guess the bit that perhaps disappoints me is, is we're talking about trying to maintain a relationship about how we, after Brexit, how we maintain that, that cohesion yeah. between the United Kingdom and the EU. And yet comments mm. like this, in my, in, in my humble opinion, yep. serves to be nothing yep. more than divisive. And I don't see how that can be any benefit going forward. Yeah, great call. Thank you very much indeed. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's 6.45. And when Nick Clegg was Deputy Prime Minister, he told us it was not going to happen. It was a dangerous fantasy. But hey, today, the French President Emmanuel Macron says we've got to build a true European army because we've got to protect ourselves against countries like the United States of America. What an insult and what a worry this is for those that believe in cooperation with America and others in NATO. On Twitter, Matthew asks me, I wonder who Macron thinks should be in charge of this EU army. Don't know. Who do you think you were kidding, Monsieur Macron? Let's go to Maidenhead and speak to Mark, another new caller to the show. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. How are you? I'm well. I just think these comments are very, very badly timed and deeply insulting to the USA, Mark. Well, you know, Macron's playing to his home audience in France. You know, they want to see a strong France. They believe they still run Europe. So I'm not surprised by his comments. Do they really still believe that, do you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. I spend quite a bit of time in France. And yeah, definitely. Mm, Interesting. But why do it? Mark, you know, I mean, you know, the Arc de Triomphe is going to be the global center of remembrance of this remarkable event uh, that took place 100 years ago on Sunday with 80 global leaders coming, why do it now? Uh, it's just, I think, literally, I think he's just trying to show that strong France and he's a strong leader. He's very, as you pointed out earlier, he's very much down in the polls. He is, uh, yes, People don't yes. believe him. They don't want him. Um, you know, most pre- French presidents have a disaster two years in and he's just facing it. And so he thinks, oh, I'm going to do this. We'll have okay, a European well, army. Okay, well, you may be right. Although, Mark, I sense 
that, you know, French people are just about as Eurosceptic as many British people, but so it may work and it may not work. Mo, how, how do you think strategically? Does a European army make sense to you? Well, my thought was that, well, what happens if, uh, think about the US, what happens if there's a dispute within Europe, is it possible for the EU army to march into a European country because they have a dispute well, with the EU? Could they declare martial law in well, Hungary or Poland? Well, well, they've already taken away voting rights from Poland um, and from Hungary. And uh, who's to say what they may do in the future, Mark? Yeah, especially when you look at the history of the US. I mean, the commander-in-chief and uh, in the USA... He was always sending in the army in the race riots during the 60s. So there was always sending in the National yeah. Guard and yeah. all of that. Which yeah. We could see that happen in Europe. Well, I think if you... I mean, generally it's a rule, isn't it? If you give government power, they tend to use it. So it's for the reason I agree with you for not building a European army. And do you think NATO works still, Mark, or not? Of course it works. It's been working ever since the end of the war. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a classic. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's working fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, OK, Mark, thank you. And Mark making the point. If they get a European army, they are likely to use it. Um, I get by text. Would they be saying this if Trump wasn't in power? He isn't going to be there forever. Mary, they really can't stand Trump. But believe you me, from my first week in this building, 20 years ago nearly, uh, I know the EU loathes America and they want to build Giscard and others have told me this they want the EU to become a global superpower that is bigger and stronger than the USA and again I think history gives some really strong lessons here that when you get emerging states that want to be big and powerful they tend in the end to become very very dangerous Lulu on Twitter says NATO is a peacekeeping force a European army would be the opposite an aggressive force we don't know that for certain Lulu but it's certainly could be. Claire is calling from Ashford and is a new caller to the show. Good evening, Claire. Hi, Nigel. Thanks for taking my call. Welcome. Um, so, uh, what do you... So, it, wasn't he being rather rude today? Uh, sorry. I, 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 yes, well, I'm just really concerned about having this conversation, you know, before Remembrance Sunday. Because yes. it's a real time to feel sort of patriotic about about Britain and our laws and our sovereignty, isn't it? Well, I would have thought so, Claire. And I, I, I think also it's a time to reflect on huge sacrifices that our forebears made so that not just us, but the rest of Europe could live in freedom. Exactly. And so that's exactly what I've been thinking about because it's so important, British laws, British sovereignty. And that's why I've been so disturbed by these news reports about the the money being which was spent in the campaign and then not knowing with Aaron Banks where it's come from. And I wondered what you thought well, about Well, I'm not discussing the referendum right here and now, Claire, but I'm very worried. I'm very worried about massive overspending by the government and many others in the campaign. Uh, Didier is calling from Wokingham. Hi, Didier. Very good evening to you, Nigel. Thanks for having me online. Uh, now, I'm guessing, I'm guessing from the accent, Didier, that you may come from France. I am French. I've been living in the UK for 15 years. Yep. Uh, for, uh, I came here for one month. I never went back. And uh, right. I still haven't, <laughs> haven't gone back to France in, in more than 10 years. And I will not, even then, I will not go back um, in case they tax me. Uh, <laughs> Is that, so you were a tax refugee, Didier, were you? Uh, yeah, well, not even. I, was, I came here with uh, £2,000. So, you know, uh, okay, after you he was, so, but, uh, right. you know, I was a more, I, I am a new EU refugee. Let's put it this way. <laughs> okay. okay. Right. I may be the, uh, the biggest <laughs> French, uh, French bread city in the UK. <laughs> uh, I'm, the, I'm the only one. Um, no, me, 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 no, me, I, I, no, Didier, I've met lots of French people living in the UK who think we're doing the right thing. But, so come on, you're president of your okay, erstwhile... No, I, I, not, not only is not my president because I don't I do not vote for crooks any longer. Right. I only vote in a, in a UK elections and not in French ones. Number one, okay. Um, okay. Uh, Macron is a president in name only. Okay, uh, basically, uh, both the EU and France import the words m misery. We, uh, they export their talents. I am one of them, like many of the French people here in the UK. Okay, um, I did listen to what Macron said today in French in my yep. mother tongue. Yeah. And it's more outrageous that you even mentioned, uh, oh, really? Nigel. 
I, I think you um, you should get a proper translator. Macron is uh, I don't want to be vulgar uh, on air. Is uh, is a disgrace, okay, to uh, to the USA, to the UK, to Canada, and all the nations that saved uh, France. Uh, pers- personally speaking, my friend, my dad is French. I lost my uh, and my mom is American. I lost my uh, American uh, granddad in uh, during the First World War, and I lost my uh, also my my uh, my uh, first my mother's granddad. So I never got mm, my granddad. Yeah. I never, yep. I never met them, yep. and yep. I found this utterly disgusting. To be, yeah. believe you me, he should be taken to court for what he said in French, because the way you put well, it. Well, Didier, that's proper. really, really interesting. Uh, that if you think our translation was being too polite in terms of what he said, and Didier, just very quickly, there seems to be a certain type of French person who almost resents America for, from saving them. Is that fair? Uh, it is. Uh, it is fair. It is fair. Yeah, I've, I've sensed that. I've sensed that. I've sensed that. I've sensed that. Didier, we are out of time. I could talk to you for hours. Great call. Huge amounts of passion. European Army, Nick Clegg. It's happening. Do come on the show with me and talk about it at some point in the future. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow night in London at 6. At 10 tonight, it's Tom Swalbrick. But up next, it's Ian Dale. And what a great caller Didier was.